Avengers Endgame had an epic climax that featured a who's who of the MCU fighting against the full might of the mad titan Thanos. After a spectacular showdown with Captain America, Thor, and Iron Man, it seems like the entire MCU had come to the rescue through sling ring portals to take Thanos out for good. Doctor Strange asks Wong if that's everyone, to which Wong answers, You wanted more? Well, Wong, as a matter of fact, there were a few other characters that we would have loved to see. Once upon a time in the land of Asgard, there was a lady named Sif. Those were simpler times. Times when Thor dated Jane Foster and the Warriors 3 had Thor's back. Times where there was still a hammer that only could be held by those who are worthy. The God of Thunder has gone through some changes, mm-hmm. The Warriors 3 were killed quickly and Asgard, along with Thor's favorite toy, were destroyed. Thor had made himself some new friends in Gorg and Meek, who will fight side by side with him in both Revolutions and Fortnite. Lady Sif was on hand to help Thor get out of God detention after restarting a war with the Frost Giants to deal with Malachite. The last we saw of Sif was on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., hunting down a Kree who robbed her of her memory. With Jane Foster now firmly in the X category, it's time to rebound with the person everyone wanted to see Thor with in the first place, Lady Sif. Not that we expected a romantic reunion during the massive battle scene. Well, unless it's Asgardian romantic, meaning two lovers locking eyes while hitting a monster super hard. That's, that's kind of romantic, right? There's another hero in the MCU who doesn't have a cool nickname or a fancy outfit. There are no gadgets or radioactive arachnids in his life. He's just a man who does the right thing, even with a Hydra double agent pointing a gun at his head. That's Agent Cameron Klein from The Winter Soldier. After his bravery during the whole S.H.I.E.L.D. Hydra debacle, Klein was part of the crew that took the mothballed helicarrier and saved the day in Sokovia. When the snappening was happening, say that five times fast, Nick Fury himself was giving instructions for Klein to lend a hand in the Battle of Wakanda. Of course, that was far too late to have mattered. As the man who started with the idea to bring together a group of extraordinary people, it would have been cool to see Nick Fury ride in with a little air support from one of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s helicarriers with Nick Fury, Cameron Klein, and the rest of S.H.I.E.L.D. It likely wouldn't have stood up to the firepower of Thanos' ship, the Sanctuary too, but if the helicarrier showed up after Captain Marvel made her dramatic entrance, then Nick Fury could have helped provide air support and watch his idea be fully realized. One thing T'Challa, the legendary Black Panther and defender of Wakanda, would like you to know is that he never freezes. But also, when it comes to Wakanda's original outreach advocate, Nakia, he totally freezes. It's alright though, because Nakia can hold her own even without the heart-shaped herb. While she was perfectly willing to help her ex regain the throne after Killmonger took it, she wasn't content to sit in Wakanda as idol royalty. She went back out in the field as part of her role as the Wakandan war dog. It's not likely that Nakia would give up her war dog ways after the snap likely feeling that she was needed now more than ever. At least we can hope she didn't go all Clinton Barton as Ronan about it. Because of her out-of-country work, she missed out on the big battle in Wakanda, so she probably would have liked to crack at the big purple pain when round three happened. Nakia proved herself more than capable in the Black Panther solo movie, with five years of suffering caused by the snap to fuel her. It might have been cool to see her take out her frustrations on a few Outriders. Poor Craglin puts up with a lot. As the second mate of a second-tier group of Ravagers, he already has his hands full, especially with crewmates with names like Taserface. He also has to deal with an erratic captain who, at times, seems to put the boy they were supposed to turn over to Ego over those of his own crew. When he tries to express his frustration, he inadvertently starts a coup. No one says the space pirate life was easy. Craglin was able to switch sides back to Yondu and the Guardians of the Galaxy in time for the mutiny to come to an end. When Yondu made the big sacrifice to save Peter Quill, Craglin's eventual loyalty was rewarded by receiving Yondu's Yaka Arrow. The arrow that doesn't need firing and is controlled by whistling and the mind, but also the heart. Whatever the case may be, it gets around, and it helped to make Yondu a feared captain. Craglin's first attempt at using the Yaka Arrow didn't go very well, but by the time the big showdown at the Avengers Corral happens, he'd have plenty of practice. Hopefully in Guardians 3, we'll see what Craglin's whistling game is really like. It's hard to imagine now, but Thanos made his first appearance in the Marvel Cinematic Universe all the way back in 2012, when he was given an Easter egg-laden report on the invasion of Earth by the Chitauri and Loki. The thankless task of giving the Mad Titan bad news fell on the shoulders of the other. 
In the Avengers, he hips Thanos to Loki's defeat, saying that to attack Earth is to court death itself. It's a nod to the Thanos of the comics, whose chief motivation for putting together a complete collection of Infinity Stones and freeing up some property by snapping half of all life out of existence was a romantic interest in the actual embodiment of Death herself. It turns out, however, that Death had eyes for someone else. It was a whole complicated thing with characters that were never introduced in the MCU, so instead, we got the universe's most severe conservation plan. As we found out more about Captain America's eventual fate, the more Game of Thrones things almost got when Cap kissed Agent 13, who's actually Sharon Carter, Peggy Carter's niece, which means it's also Steve Rogers, uh, you know what, it's best not to dwell on that. When Steve Rogers was making his transition from 1940s war hero to 21st century super spy, tabs were kept on him via his neighbor and super spy with the codename Agent 13. Of course, she had more than one reason to use a codename. With her aunt being a founder of S.H.I.E.L.D., she had a lot to live up to. Sure, she doesn't have any superpowers or a special weapon, but Outlanders and Chitauri alike can be shot and punched. And Agent Sharon Carter is good at both things. Captain America got to fight his final fight next to his oldest friend and his closest friend, so it would have completed the showing for him to also fight alongside the family friend. Family Rogers, keep that kiss short or at least don't tell Peggy about it. She's your family. There are a lot of people in the universe who have beef with Thanos. Even before he acquired the stones and snapped out half of all life, he was just doing it manually, going from world to world and getting rid of half of them. Even if he made some of them his children, they still ended up seriously hating the guy. We can't imagine why. There's one group, however, that has to harbor a pretty intense hatred for the Mad Titan, and that's the Nova Corps. The galactic police force housed on Xandar didn't go looking for an Infinity Stone. They just ended up with the stone after Ronan starts using it to restart an old war, which put them right at the top of Thanos' list. It's possible that they were wiped out entirely, except for one who's making his way to Earth to pass his suit on to Richard Ryder so he can become Nova in an upcoming MCU project. Maybe. In the superhero world, titles can get passed down from one person to the other. Long before the MCU was introduced to Scott Lang as Ant-Man, there was another Ant-Man. In the comics, that Ant-Man is also a founding Avenger, and the super scientist responsible for the oopsie that was Ultron. His companion and wife was also into the teeny tiny life as the Winsome Wasp, another founding Avenger and one that came up with the name. Those were, of course, the original first couple of Getting Small, Hank Pym and Janet Van Dyne. Just like current Ant-Man Scott Lang and current Wasp, Hope Van Dyne, Hank and Janet had similar suits and similar abilities. In fact, most of the time, Lang is wearing Hank's old suit. The new one has a few bugs. Not only could the elder terrors of tininess have joined in in the fight, Janet has a whole new set of powers from her time in the Quantum Realm. It would have been cool to get a sneak peek at what some of those might be. It took more than getting the future Avengers all in one place to get the Avengers to truly assemble. Before they were a team, they were a time bomb that was eventually set off by Loki unleashing the Hulk on a helicarrier. One of the things that he didn't count on was the ever-vigilant Phil Coulson doing his best to handle the situation. Coulson didn't survive the encounter, but his death at the hands of Loki brought the team together. Then, being a comic book character, his death was undone after a visit to Tahiti. He's been the on-again, off-again secret leader of S.H.I.E.L.D., with the organization in shambles after it was revealed that they were infiltrated by Hydra. During that time, he's also discovered an old Kree science project that gives certain people powers. That's known as the Inhumans. There are a number of Inhumans now on the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. team that would have probably liked to have been a part of the fight. And we guess the Inhumans from the Inhumans miniseries could have come as long as they didn't say anything until they got there. Shhh. While the MCU has been a strictly PG-13 affair on the big screen, over on the streaming service Netflix for a few brief seasons, we got a hard look at the rough lives of Marvel's so-called street-level heroes. Starting off with Daredevil, then Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and finally the immortal Iron Fist, the unlikely quartet took up the mantle of the Defenders. The Defenders came together when it turned out that the Hand's plan was to destroy New York City to get some of the sweet, sweet dragon bone dust from Kun Lun. The skeleton is of a previously defeated dragon, Xiao Lao, which is how one becomes the immortal Iron Fist. The idea was entertained to bring back the quartet to the big screen, but it was ultimately decided not to, so we never got to see Jessica Jones fly properly with a blockbuster budget, or cracking a beer as the women assembled to defend the gauntlet. Bonus points would go to Daredevil. After that hallway fight, we're almost afraid of what he'd do to an alien horde. There was an unexpected solo debut in Captain Marvel. 
Goose, the cat that belonged to the undercover Cree scientist Marvell, was actually a flurkin. The very name sends shivers down the spine of anyone in the know and sends up only question marks for those who aren't. What we're told is that they're one of the most dangerous creatures in the universe. Nick Fury finds that out when Goose opens his head and unleashes a nest of tentacles to consume a squad of Kree. Goose quickly became Nick Fury's secret weapon and a fan favorite. Goose was also kind enough to store the Tesseract until a hairball spit it back out. There's no telling how much Flurkins can eat, but their ability to absorb could have turned the tide against Thanos. The good guy could have sent an ally that helped him switch effortlessly between being the cutest little cat and a Lovecraftian horror monster. Maybe Jatari can't be unnerved, but it'd be worth trying. Okay, so here's where it gets a little tricky. In the TV show Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., we were introduced to Robbie Reyes, one of the people who goes by the name of Ghost Rider. The Ghost Rider started off as a curse by Mephisto to a motorcycle stuntman, trying to get out of a soul contract. Robbie's spirit of vengeance in the comics is the spirit of a dead relative. In the MCU, however, Reyes becomes the Ghost Rider by being given the power by another Ghost Rider very heavily suggested to be Johnny Blaze. During Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Coulson actually convinces the spirit of vengeance to take over his body in exchange for Coulson's ability to cheat death. After that, it's unclear what happens to the spirit, but with the announcement of a Robbie Reyes Ghost Rider show on Hulu for 2020, chances are it made it back to him. It's more than just Hellfire. The Mad Titan and Ghost Rider have a history. Cosmic Ghost Rider came for Thanos. Unfortunately, since Thanos doesn't feel guilt, the Penance Stare is a bit of a rush. To have the Hell Charger make its way to Thanos only for him to laugh off the Penance Stare would have underlined how much of a villain Thanos really is. It was a long road that ended with a noble sacrifice that eventually re-earned Yondu the respect of the Ravager community, showing up for Yondu's funeral to give him a proper send-off. It was a long road mostly because the man who saved Yondu from the Kree prison and made him into a Ravager in the first place had exiled Yondu when he found out that he was trafficking children for ego. We guess it didn't matter that he kept the kid instead. That man was Takar Ogord, or Stakar of the House Ogord in the comics. Inside the comics, Takar of the House Ogord, or Starhawk, is a complicated fella. He shared a body with his adopted sister until they fell in love and had to be separated. Regardless of his complicated comic book history, Stakar proved to also be interesting in the MCU, where he banned and then unbanned Yondu from the Ravagers. Even more intriguing was the mid credit scene where Stakar sat with his comic book Starhawk teammates Charlie 27, Alita Gord, Mainframe, and Krugar, talking about getting the band back together. The final fight with Thanos would have been a sweet opening gig. The Guardians of the Galaxy haven't had a fixed lineup, but it's always had an odd one. That includes a period of time when the Guardians worked out of nowhere and included the head of security, Cosmo the Space Dog. Moviegoers would recognize Cosmo the Space Dog as the space-suited dog that licks the defeated the Collector that disgusted Howard the Duck. That Cosmo was part of the Collector's collection before Drax drunk-dialed Ronin for some late-night revenge. In the comics, Cosmo is a dog that the Soviet Union sent to space only to have it hit with gamma rays and given telekinetic powers. He's no slouch either, having been able to take on none other than Adam Warlock. That's the guy in the cocoon at the end of Guardians 2. While we don't get backstory on the MCU's Cosmo the Space Dog, we imagine it's not that different. At the very least, he'll have all the same abilities. There are thousands of enemies to get through, and suddenly, a dog in a spacesuit clears the way with his mind. What's not to love about that? We never got a formal introduction to the children of Thanos, the Black Order. They just showed up and started monologuing and breaking stuff. However, they made a pretty good showing for themselves. Ebony Maw was able to capture Doctor Strange. Corvus Glaive and Proxima Midnight held their own against powerful Avengers, Vision, and Scarlet Witch before the rest of the rogue Avengers showed up. It took the Hulkbuster armor to take out Cull Obsidian, and that was the first time around. The second time, they were actually working together as a unit. That is, except for the one part of the team who hasn't been introduced into the MCU yet, Supergiant. You'd think that with a name like that. The powers are obvious, but you'd be wrong. Instead, Supergiant, a super powerful telepath, who has to feed off the intellect of others. There were people who point to a pre-release clip where you can hear a whisper about psychic powers, which seemed to hint at Thanos using his unstable manipulator, but it never happened. Of course, with an army as big as Thanos's, there's no telling if she was there, but just not on screen. With the Black Order gone for good, who knows if we'll ever see Supergiant in the MCU. Those are some of the suggestions we might have made to Wong when he asked Doctor Strange if he wanted more people to fight Thanos. 
What are your favorites? Who wasn't there that you would have liked to see? Let us know in the comments and be sure to subscribe to CBR for more MCU videos. Thanks for watching.